As I was leaving my house this evening, my wife said to me, who in the world is going to come to a shir on a Wednesday night before Pesach? I said, whoever doesn't want to clean the house for Pesach, they come to the shir. That's the question. But I see, Baruch Hashem, there's plenty of people that did want to clean their house for this year. As one of the members of the Link community called me yesterday to tell me, Rabbi Horowitz, even though that I wasn't there in person to hear your shir on Monday night with Rabbi Brander, and I wasn't able to listen in on Zoom with Rabbi Brander, but you should know it was sent out on Rabbi Brander's WhatsApp to the entire community. And he said, even though you think maybe not so many people, but everybody's listening from afar. So we have a nice crowd in the room. We have a nice crowd on the Zoom. And then afterwards, it'll be blasted out to the entire universe. And everybody will hear the Haggadah insights that Rabbi Brander has to offer us tonight. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to uh, be working together with a dear friend of mine, Rabbi Brander. My, one of my children asked me the other night, how did you and Rabbi Brandon become friends? So I said, you know, it, it started years ago when I realized that he was one of the teachers for my wife in Yula, many, many, many years ago. And anyone that had a had an impact on my wife already is one of my best friends in the world. And we know each other now for many, many years, Baruch Hashem. And we started this year about uh, four years ago when COVID was breaking out in the world. And he called me to ask if we do something on Zoom together. And I think we had like maybe a thousand people on that Zoom, Rabbi Brando, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. thousand, two thousand people, I think. I'm still getting calls about that one. And uh, afterwards, when Zoom was over and we came back in person, we decided we'll continue doing it. And uh, we always did it at Link. And last year, we tried to uh, coronate an evening here in, in uh, Makar Chaim. And uh, we're going to try to do it again, Be'ez Hashem. So, I'm not going to speak as much as Rabbi Brandon is going to speak because you can hear me anytime that you want. I might say something tonight. I'm going to say my Shabbos a Gadol Drush and I don't want to ruin the surprise. Or I'll say something. I might say one of the Drushes. So Rabbi Brandon, you're in good you're in good hands over here. I'll speak sparsely along the way just to uh, fill in the airtime, the dead space that is there. But without any further ado, it's really an honor, a pleasure and the real merit for us to be able to call Rabbi Brander, the Rosh Kol of Link, and Pico Robertson to grace us with his words. Thank you, Rabbi Brander. You know, it's special to be here. Um, you know, here you have the Zoom set up so nicely. Everything's misudar. I'm like a little bit... Uh, flighty and a little bit, uh, and that's, that's organized. So in the middle of our shear, the Zoom went off because I didn't have it properly, proper power. So uh, you should appreciate that your Rav is not only a very inspiring person, but he is also a personality of Hachana and a personality of uh, class and uh, a regal, wonderful um, role model. His wife uh, is taught me much more than I taught her. Um, which is really what Chazal say anyway. They say that the students always teach more than the teachers. That's mitamida yose mikulam. That's what the rabbis teach. And then maybe that's really a nice way to start our conversation, um, our equal time conversation about the Haggadah. Um, I want to share with you a vignette that happened to me yesterday. Yesterday, I this is sort of like a, a, a pop-up panel by Gordon, myself, and Mrs. Uh, Rose, Robinson Rose, from Pico Robertson, we had the opportunity to interact with 30 Israeli teenagers. And um, these were individuals who had been in LA for nine or 10 days. Um, they were from Tel Aviv. Um, 20 or so of them were Israelis and 10 of them were like Americans. They have some type of relationship going on, um, some type of um, formal, formal relationship. And they showed them all the wonderful um, parts of Los Angeles, you know, the, uh, I apologize for being somewhat irreverent, you know, they showed them um, all the uh, the food pantries, and they had a, a few uh, female rabbis that they were in interacting with, and they had a lot of, like, all the, all the, all the hallmarks of the strong Los Angeles Jewish community, and then so somebody woke up, 
the last minute and they decided to um and they decided maybe it would be nice that they should be exposed to from Yidin. So we were the last day of the program. And um and the person who ran the program, um he uh he gave us a little preparation and he we we were we didn't know what it was gonna be, and he gave us like a few questions, a few questions that he was going to ask us and um, you know, what does Judaism mean to you? And various other um, prosaic, um, cliche type of questions. And we started, and we started that that conversation. And all of a sudden, Mrs. Rose, in a brilliant stroke, said to the said to the thirty teens who are, you know, did, they were 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, I'd say there were about seventy percent were, were young ladies, and um, they didn't necessarily want to be there. It wasn't 100% sure they wanted to be there. And then she turned to him and goes, she said, forget about the questions that he's asking us. What are your questions? Let's have a real conversation. What are your questions? And within the next half hour, the questions were fast and furious. The questions were, what's with the Orthodox Jews and what about the, the woman's role and what does Emuna mean and what's with the Haredim and what does that have to do and, and why, uh, why is it that uh, the Torah is antiquated and all that. And it was the most unbelievable. And what do you think of me? You know, I, um, I, 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 uh, I pray with Tefillin at the Western Wall. And what do you think of me? Like, and it was the most unbelievable conversations. And I can tell you, that almost all of the students took down our phone numbers and they felt a deep connection, a deep kesha. And the reason is because a question that is asked in a real and sincere way is actually a means of forging a relationship. There are no answers to questions not asked. There is no chibur. There is no deep connection unless you feel a lacking. If I'm all right and nothing is missing in my world, then there's no need for me to push myself. It was an incredible flip. Instead of them being, instead of us being asked these formal questions, they asked questions from the heart. And I want to read to you the words of the Rambam. And I'm going to challenge you. And I'm going to challenge you also. The I want to read to you the words of the Rambam. The Rambam in chapter 7 in the laws of Chamit and Matzah, the Rambam talks about the, mit, the mitzvah of telling the story. And he has three components to the mitzvah. And we have to think about this in a very deep way. The first component the Rambam says is you have to teach the facts. Mitzvah lehodia libanim vafilu lo sha'alu. Even if they don't ask, you still have to you have to teach them what what happened on Pesach night. Kadosh Baruch Hu, and pay, it's interesting. The Rambam doesn't even talk about the miracles that happened afterwards. He doesn't mention anything about the splitting of the sea. No mention of that in the Rambam's Agada. After the miracles that happened on Pesach night, and we have to be misaper benisa beniflaos, and it's important for us and I myself. Well, on my agenda, to look into the Midrashim, the Midrashic literature, to make it come alive. To, 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 you have to share information. You have to make it exciting. But then the Rambam says, lasos shinui balayla hazeh. And you also have to make changes on this night. Kedei sheyiru habanim, so that the children should see, yishalu, and they should ask. And they should ask, Note, the Rambam doesn't talk about the four questions of the Manishtana. In fact, many say in the Rambam, that's the answer, not the question. It's interesting. The way we do it, we actually sing the Manishtana, right? That's, ours. that's not a question. When's the last time somebody ever asked, ever sung a question to you? That is a little bit weird. Don't you think? The Rambam seems to say that Manishtana is actually the beginning. The, the formal Manishtana is the beginning of the answer. 
But Rav Chaim Soloveitchik learned based on this Rambam, listen carefully, that actually you should be marbe b'shinuyim. You should actually have many different aspects, many eccentric aspects, maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit, a little bit different than the norm. Not what it says in the Haggadah, now is the time to ask the questions. No, you have to do shinuyim. You have to make changes so that the children will want to ask the question. And they'll ask, until, you, until they ask the question, what good is giving an answer? So isn't that interesting? You need to think about how are you going to evoke the questions? What are you going to do? Are you going to have dollars, like, you know, the Seder dollars, which will be given to the one who asked the good question? Will you bring marshmallows or very, I don't know, maybe some, maybe, I don't know, in the valley, maybe it's sugar is like a thing, so you can't, maybe you want to bring raisins, but people are traumatized from raisins. I can tell you stories of people traumatized with raisins. I, I, uh, I grew up and all I got was raisins. All my friends got like, you know, they got these Laffy Taffy's and sourdoughs and all that. But you got to think about it, maybe dress funny. Maybe figure out something that's evocative. But, the, but the, it's not scripted. The moment it's scripted, mm -hmm. now is the time for the formal Manishtana. That's beautiful. It's beautiful but it's not evocative. The Rambam is very clear. You got to evoke the question. So that's, that, to me, that's a fascinating thing. Why? It's interesting. And, and I, I don't have a great answer to this question. I have a little bit of an answer. Where does the Rambam get this from? Where, where, what's the source in the Torah that you have to ask questions? In other words, yeah, it says in the Torah, if your child will ask a question. It doesn't say in the Torah that you have to evoke the question. Where did the Rambam get it from? It's not just the Rambam, it's part of our Misora. So I want to tell you what I think the answer is. I don't have, I'm not 100% sure, but I think this is the answer. What's the, what, what do we call the book from which we're going to read on Seder night? Called the Haggadah. Anybody know why we call it Haggadah? Um, I'm asking questions. Feel free to respond. Lehagid, okay. But where does that come from? What's that? So it comes from that word Haggadah comes from a famous pasuk in the Torah. Probably somebody there in the Hebrew in the uh, in the Zoom Hebrew probably uh, you know familiar with this as well. There's a pasuk in the Torah, which is, You will tell your child on that day, this is a pasuk in Sefer Shmos, Parashas Bo, you will tell your child on that day, this was because of this, because of the mitzvot Shem did for me when I left Mitzrayim. So the word, that phrase, is actually the source, according to most of the Rishonim, Interestingly, not the Rambam, but according to most of the Shem, the source of the mitzvah of telling the story is Vigadetol Levincha. That possible. Tell your child. Now, we, we know there are four children. Which child is this verse talking about? Is it the, is it the simple son? Because the simple son asks the question. Is it the wicked son? No, the wicked son also speaks. Is it the wise son? Not him either. So who, who is the primary mitzvah focused on? No. The one that does not ask. So what is the nature of the mitzvah? Is the nature of the mitzvah a download? Or is the nature of the mitzvah extraction? The higadetol avincha is bring the Torah to this child so that you can evoke the question. And that's why it says in the Haggadah, the one that doesn't know how to ask, what's that, I apologize? The one that doesn't know how to ask, 
at anybody know what, it, what the language that God is? The one that doesn't know how to ask at sach lo. The four sons, the one that asks, you will open it up for him. Open what up? Just tell him the information. No, don't tell him the information. What does it mean, at psach lo? Open up the questions. The reason why we know that the mitzvah on Seder night is about questions is because the Torah dafka tells us the mitzvah not in the context of a response, which would have been the other three sons, but dafka in the context of what? In the context of the one who doesn't know how to ask, evoke the question. So that's challenge number one. You thought you were just getting a shear? You're getting homework. Challenge number one is think to yourself, how, what, are you, what are you going to do? And it's going to be very different based on who's coming to your Seder. Think to yourself, what are you going to do to evoke questions? By the way, bribery is fine. Chazal speak about this all the time. You can bribe your children. That's, a, that's part of Chinuch in a, in, a, in a proper context. It's a pleasure to ask Rabbi always to uh, equal time. <laughs> No, we live in a very uh, interesting generation where everybody is looking for recognition. You have people that are on their line on their social media and they post something and they're looking for the thumbs up. And that makes them feel good. I don't know why it is. A thumbs up makes them feel good. You post something on your WhatsApp status and you check like every 20 minutes, who looked? Oh, he looked. Wow, she, she looked. Oh, wow, they're over there. They looked. Suddenly you feel good about yourself because somebody somewhere out there in the world is looking at what you posted about yourself. You get even bigger, you have some kind of big deal that's going on and people are calling you, telling you all. You feel good when people notice you and recognize you. Now, who are all the people that are online on social media? The thousands of followers that people have the 20,000, the 100,000 people that are in the world that are following that person day and night, watching what they do, what they eat, where they sleep, what they drink, what they're busy with, who are all those people? So if they're like really hush of a people, very prominent people, so then that's really a cover, that's really an honor to the person because someone that is honorable, somebody whose time is valuable, somebody who is an important person, they're taking notice of me. But if those hundreds of thousands of followers that the person has breathing down his neck day and night, giving the thumbs up and the, the okay and 100%, wow, yeah, posting all these things, themselves are wandering souls, themselves are lost somewhere in the middle of the world, confused and forlorn and the like, so then what chashivas, what prominence does it give to me? Because I'm picking up the dregs that are around there. They have nothing else to do all day long. They're on and on and on and thumbs up and here and there. What, is it, what does it mean to me? I attracted the attention of the lower element of the society. Very nice. On the Seder night, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Dizar tells us, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu sits in Shemayim with his Pamal delay with his heavenly court, all of his malachim, all of his angels. And he goes around the world to every single place in the universe where there's a Jewish family that's making a Seder. And he brings down the malachim, he brings down the angel, and he says, Chazu, take a look. Look at my children after 2,000 years or 3,500 years that they were let out of Egypt. Look what they're doing tonight. They're talking about me. They're talking about the gula, the redemption. They're talking about the slavery. They're talking about the miracles, the wonders, the signs. Look what they're talking about. And he tells all of his malachim, all of his angels, look how chashiv, how prominent, how great, how amazing, how important my children, Klal Yisrael is, that after all has been said and done thousands of years, they sit at their table. They speak the wonders of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Their mar bebesipa Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. They increase the amount that they talk about it. 
And they do it all to be able to sing about the praises of Hashem, instill within themselves the amun of what it means to be a Jew, and to march on triumphantly by the end of the Seder, where each and every one of us will try to look at ourselves as if we were the ones that left Egypt. Says Hashem to Pamal Yedileitiz Malachim, look at all of my people. After thousands of years, they're still in the trenches of Amuna. They're still in the system of Torah. They're still in the belief of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If Hashem comes and notices a person, there is no greater accolade and there's no greater covet, honor, and respect that a person could have. If you are so valuable in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he gathers around all of his malachim, all of his angels, and he says, these are my children, look how much I love them. It's much better than a thumbs up. It's better than 300,000 followers. It's better than being your name posted all of going viral. It's better than all of that. Because if the master of the universe, the creator of the entire world, of flesh and blood, of every single neshama that is there, He's paying attention to you. It shows the intrinsic value that you have. Like a parent who can't stop looking at their child and is with those loving eyes and that warm embrace, the child knows how beloved they are because my parent loves me so much. When a Jew sits by the Seder table on the Seder night, they have to know how beloved you are in the eyes of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he's shifting heavens and earth just to let the angels peer in to your Seder table, listening to how you tell over the story. Every single person in this room is going to tell over the story of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim differently. Because every single person has a different access, a different connection, a different chibur, as Rabbi Brando was saying, a different feeling that we have when we speak about what it meant to be a slave, what it meant to go free. The challenges and the tribulations, everybody relates differently. So when you tell the story, it will be different than the way that I tell the story. And when you tell the story, it will be different than the way that he tells the story. And the trick, of course, is to try to find the story and the message that is going to be something that we call Shavala, called Nefesh, will be applicable to everyone that is sitting at the table. Something simple, something basic, something down to earth, something understandable. And perhaps one of the messages that we have to give over to our children, to ourselves, to the people that will be at our table is, know how chashev. Know how valuable you are. Know how important you are that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is schlepping around the whole world tonight and he's in our house right here at the table. It's fact or fiction. The cup goes down when you call Eliyahu Novi into the room. I think they ran some psychological study of does the, does the wine in the cup actually go down the cup of Elijah when he comes to drink? Does it go down? And many people claim that they can see that the wine goes down. I don't know if Elijah the prophet is drinking wine in everybody's house. He's not a wino, Baruch Hashem. He's a prophet, Elio Anavi. But the idea that Elio Anavi comes to our house, the Shina comes to our house, Malachim are coming to our house. Chaviv and Yisrael, the Jewish people, are beloved. And you should know how beloved we are because HaKadosh Baruch Hu lets us know how beloved we are in the eyes of Hashem. And if we could just walk away from a Seder, knowing our inherent value as a Jew, knowing how much we mean in the eyes of Hashem, how HaKadosh Baruch Hu longs all year long for our Seder table, with all of the balagan and the circus that goes on by some of the tables, by all the people that are saying, no, 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 matzah balls, matzah balls, no, 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 no. I was once at a Pesach hotel. Baruch Hashem, I don't have to go to those hotels anymore. And we were at a certain hotel, and uh, the davening was, let's say, quick. You would have liked it there. 
It was very, it was very quick davening, and we had a very long davening in the morning. You know, you have you have shachris, you have halil, you have kriyas Torah, and you have musaf. So davening is really supposed to be a good cholamai davening, or a yom, it should be at least like an hour, fifteen minutes minimum, right, Mark? Minimum, maximum. You're getting up to like hour half, hour forty five minutes. Depends on how much everyone's getting it. So at this particular hotel where we were, the minion from start to finish, you ready? Start to finish, Shachris, Halel, reading the Torah and Musaf, 45 minutes. Not bad, no? Too much. So I was there that year, and uh, Hanan Gordon was there also that year in the hotel with us. And we had a whole little chevr of guys, yeshiva guys and everything. We were going out of our minds. Davening was so fast. So we decided we have to make a second minion. This can't go on like this. This is ridiculous. We have, they want to daven fast, daven fast. We need to make a minion that's going to go slow and daven the right way. So we spoke with the head of the, of the programming. And we asked, can we take over the room the next night, with the, uh, the next day for a second minion so we could daven slower? And they said, sure, no problem. You advertise. You tell them you want to make the minion. You can make an 8 o'clock or 8.30 minion, whatever you would like. So sure enough, we announced after Mincha Marv that, that night, there's going to be a second minion of the slow minion for those that would like it. I remember Hanan Gordon got up and he said, you know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in the Pesach Hotel also. And when you dive in, don't forget you're diving to Hashem. So we got to dive in regular. We got to dive in slow the right way. Okay. So the next morning, the first minion took place, and then the second minion took place, and it was all the whole yeshiva guys, <laughs> some guys in Kolo. It was about maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 of us. And in the back, there were three old men who didn't realize that this was the slow minion. They walked in, they said, wow, second minion, what a machayah, we could sleep in and still, you know? So they're standing in the back, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that I davened Shachris and Halil as slow as I possibly could. And it was getting very long in there. And these three guys were literally, if they would have had hair on the head, they would have been pulling out their hair. They were going out of their mind. And suddenly, in the middle of Kriyasa Torah, when it was taking time to wrap up the Torah, one of the guys yells, Schnell, Schnell, which means quick, quick. Omelets, omelets. The omelets were waiting by the omelet bar for breakfast. <laughs> HaKadosh Baruch Hu is so in love with Klal Yisrael. Even if he yells Schnell and omelets on Pesach, he still loves us. It doesn't matter. But a person has to remember when they're standing by the Seder, when they're sitting by the Seder table and the family's all around and the kids are all around and they're all doing their songs and they're showing you all their, their projects. And this one is, wants to go quicker, and this one wants to go slower. Just let the show run itself, Be'ez Hashem, and you will see. Whether you see the wine go down in the glass, or you don't see the wine go down, it doesn't matter. You should know that in that room, at your Seder table, is the Shechina and Malach Asharis and the angels. And that shows the great value and the import of each and every one of us. And if that alone is what we walk out with from the Seder night, plus all the message that Rabbi Brandon is going to give for the next hour, if that alone is all that we walk out with, how important and valuable and precious and beloved we are in the eyes of Hashem, you won't need thumbs up and you won't need to make postings and you won't need to be on social media to feel good about yourself. You'll feel good about yourself because you know how Kodesh Baruch Hu feels good about you. After somebody sent me today a, uh, a something fascinating connected to what Rabbi Horowitz said, um, which is, Tyler's, who wants to be an auctioneer? And uh, basically, it's, um, do you daven as fast as an auctioneer? And the, uh, the somebody went through the very uh, time-intensive uh, labor of figuring out how many words there were in Psuke de Zimra, 2064 if you're Nusach Svard, 1799 if you're Nusach Ashkenaz, and it goes through all the whole list, and basically, if you daven um, Psuke de Zimra as an Ashkenazi in 7.2 minutes, 
then you are basically an auctioneer. Um, and if you daven, that's 250 words per minute. And if you daven um, in 12 minutes, which I think is probably more, many people do, at least we do, or some people do, about 15 actually, then it's, I'm sorry, the, you know, and uh, that's about 150 words per minute. And uh, if you're slow, slow is 16.4 minutes. So they have a whole cheshman here of what, how long does it take to daven? And uh, the upshot of it is that if you are a, an auctioneer, it is impossible to daven Nusach Ashkenaz less than 25.2 minutes. And if you daven, if you speak fast, 150 words per minute, it's impossible to daven Nusach Ashkenaz in less than 42.1 minutes. Um, that's for Monday and Thursday, Monday and Thursday. Okay, so so uh, I've always get a kick at this. At one time, uh, one time I had this course of davening with Rav Moshe Wolfson Shlita, who's a man who's close to 100. He's a base, a few Bate Medrash, but one in Brooklyn. And they daven super slow, super slow. And I had, and I knew that. I walking in, I knew that. And they all they all stand up for Pesukim so Zimra. They have these big plastic stenders, so you know you don't have to do Pesukim Zimra like you, if you're sitting. It's easy, but if you're standing. You want to be able to see it. There are these plastic stenders that are on the table. And it was a Thursday, but there was a bris, so there was no tachanun. And it took two hours, two hours to daven. And I have to tell you, since I, if somebody's like walked into that minion, could have been Gehenna. But 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 if you knew what you were getting yourself into, it was Mamish Gan Eden. The ability to appreciate spirituality, the ability to connect with being not a goof, but being a neshama, a soul. That's part of what it means, Pesach night, when we say to Hashem, you took us out of Mitzrayim. What is the depth of that idea? You took us out of Mitzrayim. There's a big machlokis, Rav and Shmuel, in the Gemara, Maseches Psachim. And we actually incorporate both of their texts in the Haggadah. Right after Manishtana, what's the line? Right after Manishtana, we finish Manishtana, what's the next, what's the line after that? Please feel free to respond. I know how good is, but okay. After it is, Avadim Hayinu Leparav Mitzrayim. We were slaves. That's the opinion of Shmuel. That's the opinion of Shmuel. We talk about we were slaves, and Hashem took us out. Biyal Chazakah was ordered to Yom. They extended with a strong hand, extended a forearm. But the opinion of Rav in the Gemara is no. We don't start from Avadim Ayinu. Does anybody know where we start from? Rav says we go way back, way back, way before being Avadim. We go back to Avraham and Terach, Mitachila, Ovde Avodazara, Hayu Avoseinu. Originally, we were idolaters. And now Hashem has brought us close to his service. The question that many ask about Rob's opinion is, what does that have to do with Mitzrayim? It's very nice that we're giving a whole sort of a retrospective on Jewish history, but that's not Mitzrayim. That was pre-Mitzrayim. That was AM, anti-Mitzrayim. This is, we're talking about Mitzrayim. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Well, why are we talking about Terach? So I just want to read to you what the Rambam says. Again, not, this is not, this is not, um, I'm just saying Dvarim Shutim, but they're so powerful. You just put it in the proper context. The Rambam says, when he talks about this mitzvah of telling the story, the Rambam says, I'm just reading to you his words. You start in a very low place and you conclude in a crescendo. You conclude with a great praise. Ketzad, how do you start? You start by telling the story that we were our fathers in the time of Terach, Umilafanov, and before him, were Kofrin, Vitoin. We were heretics and we made terrible mistakes. Achar Hahevel, we went after vanity. We did not lead a Tachlitic lifestyle. We didn't live tachlis. We wrote bin achar avodazara, and we ran after idolatry. 
ומסיים בדס האמס. And you end, you end with the true, I don't like using the word religion for das, you end with the truth of truth, the, the, the holy truth. Shekervanu hamakom lo, listen to the words of the Rambam. Shekervanu hakadosh baruch hu, God hamakom, brought us close. Kerav otanu, he brought us close to him. Vehivdi lanu min hatoim, and he, he made Havdalah. He separated us from those that went astray. And he brought us closer and close and closer to his oneness. In other words, what is the idea, according to Rav, of Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? It is not removing the shackles of bondage. Rather, it is the ultimate conclusion of a historical destiny that began way before Mitzrayim. But we needed Mitzrayim, and that's a whole conversation, why? But we needed Mitzrayim in order to get to a place of closeness to the Ribbon Shol. And the ultimate celebration of Pesach is not freedom from, not freedom from, it's freedom to. In fact, there's a word that we use in Hebrew for freedom that does not appear in the Torah. And yet Pesach is called by that very name. Zman Cheiruseinu. Do you know the word Cheirus does not appear in the Torah? There is a word for freedom that does appear in the Torah. When the slave is finished, his six years, he goes lachofshi. He goes free. What's the difference between chofesh and Cheirus? Chofesh means you're on vacation. Cheros, the rabbis tell us in Pirkei Avos, is etymologically connected to another word. Anybody know what that word is? Charut or charus. Etched. The 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 lettering of the Ten Commandments. Is, are, are etched on the luchas. I remember many years ago, we're talking 1991. And I remember they told when people told, heard I'm going to LA, they said, just right, Brenda, one thing. Just LA, it's a, it's a, a lot of sakana. LA is Rashi Tevis, Lo Aleinu. You know, not, not on any of us. So they said, just one thing, make sure you have these billboards, don't look up. Don't look up. So one time I looked up and I saw this is a true story. I saw there was a picture of Moshe Rabbeinu um, on Har Sinai with the Luchos. I said, what, what are people saying? It was a spiritual place. It's an unbelievable thing. And on the bottom, it's a big billboard. On the bottom, you could probably Google this and find it, like, you know, the retros 30-something years ago, 32 years ago. And on the bottom, is that there's Klal Yisrael. And there's a blurb that's coming out from the, you know, like a comic blurb. That Moshe is holding the luchos, and there's a blurb, and the blurb says, "Can't forget this. No thanks." Meaning, responding, Moshe is holding the luchos. No thanks. I'd rather listen to K Rock, one hundred six point seven. Now, I I don't listen to K Rock, but that's one of the most brilliant advertisements because I I will ever I will forever remember. I don't remember what daf something is on the Gemara, but I remember K Rock is one. Is it still one? Don't don't answer. One hundred six point seven. What's the imagery? The imagery is, if you have the luchos, you're suffering. No thanks. I'd rather listen to Kerak. And we believe the ultimate freedom, al tikre chorus el We believe the ultimate freedom is the kervanu yichudo. The ultimate freedom is, to what? Is to bring people closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch to have an appreciation of spirituality. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. I want to share with you an image that I think about sometimes. Now, I, I for many of us, um, a turning point in our lives was when we went to Eretz Yisrael for a year or two. Um, those of us that went through the system, we got more excited in our learning. So 
I always am amazed. I was always amazed at how it's, it's changed a little bit. How Eretz Yisrael has sort of a, how it has such a metamorphosis. But I remember when a kids would come back from yeshiva. Um, I don't have a pen on me, but I, I, I would try to demonstrate it. But kids, when they when they're learning, when they're learning, so I, I used to see these kids that became like a thing. They would take their pen or pencil. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. And they would like sort of like play with their pen and pencil as they were. You know what I'm talking about? Am I, am I weird? They would play with their pen and pencil as they were like learning, or like as they were. It was like, and I never mastered that. I never was. It was. It was, it was after my time. It was like a modern thing. It's after my time. It was probably, probably was circa 1997. I did. So I was. I was asking, "What are you doing?" Like it was like so. It was like so weird. And somebody said to me, "Very Brander, don't you realize?" Because you see the simcha, I saw the joy when people are learning these, when they're, when they're discovering, the rediscovering or discovering the joy of learning. So the, so the fellow said to me, Brandon, they're dancing, their pen is dancing. They're expressing their joy. Take a look for a moment when you see people who feel connected to the Ribbon Sha'ala. Take a look for a moment and see what their davening looks like, what their learning looks like, what their eating looks like. It's interesting to point out, the Chassam Sofer points out, Pesach is the only day of the year that we have a Torah mitzvah of eating. Only day of the year. We will eventually come back to Karbonos, but it's the only, it's the only vestige. But think about this. But that mitzvah, that mitzvah of eating, which is, by the way, non-Jews also eat. But that mitzvah of eating is preceded by two paragraphs of halal, and it is followed by the rest of halal. We never split up halal except for Pesach night. We never say halal at night except for Pesach night. We never say halal sitting except for Pesach night. What's going on? So there are a lot of explanations. But perhaps the simplest idea, I think the Nitziv says something like this, is that the meal itself is part of the halal. Even when a Jew is eating, when a Jew is eating, they have the capacity of infusing spirituality into every component of life. I often grapple with that, and this is really one of the most important ideas in Yiddishkeit, that each and every one of us in some places are still enslaved. Every single... Even though we have, we've bought, been through the Seder, but we have to ask ourselves a question. HaKadosh Baruch Hu took us, as Rav says, he took us out from a place of confusion and he brought us close to him. But what are our mechitzos? What are our barriers? Is the mitzvah of Seder night for the children? Or is it for me? It's clear from the Rambam that the mitzvah of Seder night is actually for you and I, not for the children. I'll explain that after oh, it's, it has, after he speaks in a moment. But the mitzvah is certainly for you and I. And the biggest proof of that is if there's nobody else at the Seder, the Rambam is very clear. He says, you still have to ask yourself the question. What's that about? The answer on a very basic level is that each and every one of us has to experience the avdus and the needs to think about what are the machitzas, the separation and the barriers. And for many of us, it could even be something like eating, the way we eat. We may pray like a Jew, but we eat like a guy. We have things that we have to work on. And when we ask ourselves the questions, then we have the capacity to overcome those challenges. There's a beautiful image that I want to leave you with. Shlomo Zalman Orbach says, he, he felt very strongly that the primary mitzvah of Seder night is for the individual, not for the parent to the child. Each one of us individually. It says in the Torah, Vigar to Levincha. Tell your child. So how do you reconcile that? Well, that we'll talk about. But Rav Shlomo Zalman, listen to this amazing image. That when he was on Seder night, when he would express 
the words of the Haggadah, and he would start with Avadim, in Yiddish, Knecht, slaves. Hayinu leparo, zainin mir given suparo. We, we were slaves to Paro. We, not just them. As the Rambam tells us very clearly, but osanu hotzi misham. If you think this is only historical, we're missing on the great opportunity. The ability to achieve freedom on Seder night in the deeper Svarim, they talk about, there's a concept known as chipazon. Anybody know what that word means? Chipazon? Alacrity. Tremendous quickness. Right? The matzah has to be made with great quickness. That very often spirituality happens in slow, healthy gains. But on Seder night, the capacity to achieve a lot in a short time is a special and an amazing segula, amazingly propitious time to jump. The word Pesach means to jump, according to many. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu jumps over us, we can jump toward HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We can jump back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We need to think a little bit about this idea of Rav, the Kervanu Yehudo. HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings us close and closer. So Horowitz said so beautifully that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he, he has tremendous confidence in us and tremendous kirva, closeness to us. If we feel the closeness of the Ribbon Shalom, we have to think about how we do that, then we will be able to, in kind, be able to respond in kind. It should be merit the Ezra Hashem to be able to tap into this Indian. Zal tell us that Kola Maisif Gaireya, anyone who adds on to something that is so beautiful, the Gaireya, they really detract. So, but Brenda is speaking so beautifully, I, I really don't want to add on because I don't want to detract from the beautiful words that he has. So, I'll try maybe just to enhance because adding on something at this moment will just take away, steal that thunder that is there that's such. Beautiful, insightful words of Miranda. Thank you. One of the highlights in the Haggadah, certainly, is the four sons. The Chacham, the wise one, the Rasha, the wicked one, the Tom, the simple one, and the Echash, and the Elisha, the one who doesn't know how to ask. But there's an introduction to the four sons, which is less famous than the four sons themselves. Baruch HaMokom Baruch Blessed is the Mokim, blessed is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is known as the Mokim, the place of this entire world. The world is resting inside of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu, blessed is He. Baruch Shenosan Toyer Ma'amo Yisrael Baruch Hu. So the next thing that we're going to praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu for, you're the Mokim, you are the place that encapsulates the entire universe. You are the makam, you are the place that fills up every single nook and cranny in the world. So what is the next great praise that we can give to Hashem? You gave your nation, you gave us Torah. Which means that the whole purpose of why HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a world, and while He fills up every little, every little vinkle, every little corner, and why HaKadosh Baruch Hu allows the world to rest, so to speak, inside of him, so that the Shekhinah permeates everything, is for one reason and one reason only, because Shenosa and Lanu Torah and Liyama Yisrael, he gave us Torah. And that's the purpose of why we're here. The purpose of why we're here is to fill up the Makim, the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made, with the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch has given over to us. Baruch Hu, blessed is he. And then we say, This Torah, which is the purpose of the entire universe, it speaks to every child in the entire world. It speaks to the child that is a chacham, that is wise. The Torah knows how to speak to the rasha, to the wicked one. The Torah is able to speak to the tom, to the one that is more simple in his mind. 
and it knows how to speak to the one who's Eido Yide Elisha, who doesn't know how to ask, like Rabbi Brandon was saying, Ad Psach Loi, you have so much in the wisdom of the Torah, there's so much that you can say over to draw out the Nisham inside. You can open up the conversation and draw them in and get them there. The Torah speaks to everyone. Our children learn the parsha every single week, starting at the age of two or three years old. The same parsha that you are learning every single week in shul. It's the same parsha. It's 30 years apart, 40 years apart from each other, the people that are learning. And yet just as you are inspired by the messages of the parsha, your little children are inspired by the messages of the parsha. The Torah speaks to every single one of us. If it's not talking to us, that means we have to find our avenue, our in, to be able to access the language of the Torah that is going to speak best to our neshama. When Avraham Avinu was going around on his world tour of being Makar of the entire universe to the belief in one God, the Rambam writes over there that one of the unique qualities that the Rambam had was he was able to hear very clearly the way that every person would ask their questions and he would answer them in a way that would speak exactly to who that person was. If they were intellectual, his answer was intellectual. If they were spiritual, his answer was spiritual. If they were practical, his answer was practical. If they were flighty and out somewhere in the sky, his answer was over there. Whatever would talk to them, because the Torah talks to everybody, he was able to bring those people in. One of the most perplexing answers that we give over here is to the Russia, to the wicked son. This young man comes to the Seder table. He's mouthing off at his father. He seems to be quite rebellious. What is all this avoided, this hard work that you're doing? It's avoided, it's backbreaking labor. Is it backbreaking at the Seder? It's so it's it might be if you're on the outside looking in, it might be a little bit annoying. You're hungry. You can smell the food wafting from the kitchen, and then you dip a little parsley into the water, you take a bite. Okay, no more eating for the next three and a half hours. Might be a little bit annoying, but avoida is backbreaking, hard bondage service that a person has. So he's rebellious. So we tell this young, we say to the young man the following. First, the Haggadah tells us, you don't even say anything. First thing you do is, as it says, hake es shinov, a person should come and they should end up blunting the teeth of the Russian. You blunt his teeth. Rabbi said, we're sitting by the Seder table. You are trying to draw your children in. We just talked about how great the Torah is. It talks to everybody. The language of the Torah with the rushes, smack him in the mouth, knock out his teeth. Is that the way that you speak to a wicked child? So of course it's not. Haggadah would never say such a thing. We know that it's not. So I saw years ago the Rav Hirsch in his beautiful way that he describes language. His, he has, a, he has a, a law, an unspoken law in, the lang, in, in, in Hebrew diktuk and grammar that any words that have the same letters or similar letters, even if they're not exactly the same word, they're related to each other. So even though that word over there means one thing and this word over here means something else, I can borrow the explanation of the word over here and I can explain uh, something deeper in the word over here. So he says the word haka, which we are translating loosely as blunt the teeth, it's really from the Lashon of naka nun kuf he, which means to cleanse. And the goal of a parent that's sitting at a Seder table with a rebellious child who's mouthing off is you get a bar of soap and you clean out that mouth. And you wash it out because it can't talk like that. Really what the Rav Hirsch means is you take the mouth that's talking so nasty and through the beauty and the wisdom of the Torah, through the messages of what it means to be a Jew, through helping this child understand whatever it is that he's struggling along inside of him and point out the 
profundity of the neshama that is inside of him, you cleanse away the rishos, the evil. You get rid of all of the <clears throat> rebellion. You get rid of his chutzpah. And you bring out of the Russia, you bring a light of kedusha of righteousness that is there. I want to leave you off with a story. See Rabbi Brander and, and Link in the city. There's like a there's like a an energy in the city that you can't sleep at night. So at Link, you can go till 9:45, 9:50, no problem. People didn't even want us to stop. You're now in Tarzana where we eat raisins. And when you're when you're surviving on raisins, you can only run a little bit over schedule. So I'm going to leave off with one story. Rabbi Brander is going to is going to finish things off, and then we will dismiss you to go home and kasha your ovens and clean your homes. About uh, seven or eight years ago, so you recall that we had a Shabbaton with a Pesach from. And it was a marvelous Shabbaton. It was so uplifting and inspiring. And for me, one of the highlights was that at every Sa'uda that we had, Rabbi Kron and I, I sat next to Rabbi Kron. And so we were schmoozing for the entire Suda by every meal, schmoozing and schmoozing stories and this and that. And it was, it was very elevating and uplifting. Shabbos came and went, and Rabbi Kron was scheduled to speak after Shabbos in, in the Valley Village. And he was going to speak about Chinuch and raising children. And he went to that lecture, and he spoke to a full crowd. And at the end of the lecture, as everybody was leaving, one woman was staying around. And she came over to Rabbi Kron, and she began crying. She said, Rabbi Kron, Rabbi Kron, your lecture was so beautiful, so beautiful about Chinuch she says, but I have a child. He's so far off the derek right now. I don't even know what Chinuch Abanim is all about. Rabbi Kron, maybe you know someone that can help my son. Like Rabbi Kron knows people in Los Angeles. He's gonna, he's, maybe he'll call Bob Linder. Bob Linder is his best friend in Los Angeles. So he says, you know, I was just in Tarzana for Shams. There's a rabbi there, Rabbi Horowitz. He seems like a nice guy. Maybe he can help your son. So listen to this story, because this is all in the hands of Hashem. He gives his mother my telephone number. The mother called me that night. I just said, Rabbi Kron, I just want to do my son. No, no, my son is struggling. Can you meet my son? I said, sure, miss, I'll be happy to. So we make a meeting. A few days later, the boy comes to my office in the old shul, late at night. No one's around. The kid walks in. You want to talk about off? The kid was off. No yarmulke. I, oh, you just, I'm not even going to go into the details. He comes into my office, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to say to this kid? What am I going to say to this kid? How am I going to show him how beautiful it is to be a Jew? What he's giving up, what he's for? How am I going to show him? So I looked at this young man, I said, are you hungry, by the way? He said, as a matter of fact, I am. I said, do you like chocolate babka? He said, I love chocolate babka. I said, wait here. I go, I run to the kitchen, and I pull out the Schwartz's chocolate babka cake that weighs about 10 pounds. It's oozing out with chocolate on all sides. And I slice up a few slices, I put it on a plate, and I bring it to this boy. And he looks, takes a bite, wow, that is delicious, that's amazing. He, po he polishes off the plate. I barely said a word, though, and then I spoke a little bit. I said one thing here, one thing there, spoke a little bit about life, nothing major. At the end of the evening, he says, do you always have babka? <laughs> I said, you come back next week, I'll have babka, don't worry. And that built up a long-running relationship that this young man and I have. It's going on about seven or eight years already. And by the grace of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this young man is now from 
This young man is now in Shiduchim. I get calls as a reference for Shiduchim for him. And he's, it's not like girls off the street. These are from families that are looking into this young man that are enamored by him. He's a very charismatic, very beautiful, young, young, special person. All because if you clean out the teeth with chocolate bankum, you never know what you could accomplish. When you show the warmth and the radiance and the beauty of Yiddishkeit to a person that is on the edge, that is traumatized, that is rebellious, you show them the warmth. When we live in such a cold world, how could they not see how beautiful it is to be in you? So Amir Sashem, as we go into our Seder tables, and we, if we, whether we have a lot of people, we have a little people, whether we have from one years old until 101 years old, whatever the crowd is going to be, we have to keep in mind, Baruch HaMokom Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanasan Lanu Torah, Shanasan Torah La'amo Yisrael. He gave the Torah to Klal Yisrael, and that Torah that he gave in our Sinai, it talks to each and every one of us. And we all have these four components inside of us. No one's just a Chacham. No one's just a Russia. No one's just a simpleton. No one just doesn't know how to ask. Everybody has all the components. Find the Torah that's going to speak to each part. And in that way, when we ingest the sweetness of the Torah on the Seder night, we will be able to say, Baruch Hu, blessed is He Hashem that has given us the key to living our lives in the way that is upstanding and respectful, honorable and beloved in the eyes of Hashem. I thank Rabbi Horowitz for inviting me. It's so beautiful to hear his wonderful Torah and the way he delivers it. Um, you are very blessed to have such a dynamic and deep and beloved um, Marada Asra. I want to share with you an interesting comment of the Baal HaTurim and something that my father said to me as I'm driving here. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll conclude basically with that. The Baal HaTurim says that on, when Yitzhak smelled the reyach, remember when Yaakov comes, Yitzhak says, Re'ei, re'ei reyach b'ni ki reyach hasadeh asher bercho Hashem. And the Baal HaTurim says that this special fragrance of Gan Eden which was emanating from Yaakov, it was Leil Pesach. There are a lot of other Mekoros, a lot of other sources that indicate this. It's Leil Pesach. Bring Shnei Gidaye Izim, bring the two goats, one's the carbon Pesach, and the Baaturim in his um, inim inimitable style says that Leil Pesach is the same gematria as Reyach. Leil Pesach is the same gematria as Reyach, which is if you do the math, or you can trust them, it's 218. 218. Mm -hmm. Leo Pesach is rech, the scent, the smell, the beautiful smell. There's something incredible that many of us, if we have such recollections, for Zoha to have the recollections of a child, we 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 carry on that, that smell. We carry on that beautiful reach, that ambiance, the ambiance and the scent of Emuna. I remember. And it's many years ago. My father used to always make me say, prepare Divrei Torah for the Seder, which then I wasn't so happy. Um, but I am greatly indebted to him because I have a deep affinity to the Haggadah for that reason. But from the time I was already eight, nine years old, my father was like, you got to say Divrei Torah, you got to prepare, you know? And I remember, without going into the whole Divrei Torah, but Ben Zoma is 70 years old. He says, Ariani ki Ben Adai, he says, Ariani ki Ben and Zoma, rather, Reani Kiven Shim Mishana, Veloza Chisi, excuse me, Veloza Benazari says, Reani Kiven Shim Mishana, Veloza Chisi, Shetayama, Yetias, and Swain Belelos. I think I knew better than um, I, I'm like 70 years old, and I never merited to, uh, I never merited to teach the obligation of mentioning the Exodus at night. I never merited to convince the Chachamim um, until Ben Zoma came. And he taught, without the technical details, he taught the Pasuk, remember the Exodus 
all the days of your life, all is an extra word, doesn't mean days, it also means nights. So if you look at a lot of the commentaries, they struggle, what was the great Kiddush of Ben Zoma? And one of the answers is that they say Ben Zoma doesn't say a lot. He doesn't say a lot in, 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 in our literature, in our Tanaitic literature. He doesn't say that much. But he does say famously that who is wise? Somebody who learns from everybody. Ben Zoma says, Ezu Chacham, Halo made me call Adam. Somebody who learns from everybody. And you know that Rabbi Elizabeth Isaiah was not 70. You know, he was really how old? He was really 18. And the Gemara in Brachas tells us that he, overnight, he developed a beard, and etc. It wasn't because he all of a sudden had Balabat, and that would have taken two or three days. But when Rabbi ben Azariah, he became old overnight too, in order that he should uh, have a certain degree of gravitas. That's what the Gemara says in Brachas. So, really, he was 18. And the Chachamim were much older than him. And even though he had a point of view, but they didn't necessarily respect him. And Ben Zoma then said, Herzachim, listen. Ezeu Chacham, who is wise? Halomi Bikoladam, learn from everybody. And I was enamored with that for Torah. I remember I saw this in one of the old, one of the original art school Agadas. And I told that to our Torah at the table, and my father started crying. Father's not an emotional man. I could, I, on one hand, I could, and a cry means like two tears. So, so I, I saw it. I said, what, what? what is that? That's such an emotional Dvar Torah. It's a beautiful Dvar Torah. So he said, that's the Dvar Torah that he remembers his father always used to say. When he came, my father was born in 1935 in Krakow, Poland. Came to America in 1950. He was in the DP camps. He he went to a different type of yeshiva. So I never really probed. I imagine he was saying that's the Torah that he heard in the DP camps. And his son is saying the same Dvar Torah that his father said. Something unbelievable about the Misora. Somewhat whimsical story, but a true story. When I was, went to yeshiva, my father was very mocked, insistent that we should have machine shmura, not hand shmura. Machine shmura, meaning, you know, there's a whole discussion in postgame, but in terms of the interesting idea of lishma, so round matzah, hand matzah is better. But in terms of the issue of chametz, so machine matzah is better. So my father is, you know, he wanted machine. So that's what I did. And then I went to yeshiva. And then all of a sudden, I went to yeshiva. I learned about the other, other opinions. And of course, you know, I'm 17, so I know much better than my father. So I told my father, I said, listen, uh, with, with your permission, I'd like to, I would like to uh, bring to the table, I would like to uh, use hand, hand matzah for, my, for the Seder. And my father is a wise man. He's a mechanic himself. My father said to me, it's not a problem. You, you're welcome to eat hand shmura. Just do me a favor. Just don't eat it at the table. So he said, I'm going to bring hummus to the table. You, you. <laughs> he had to get, it's very good at that. Very good. Happens to me. So it, it, I brought it, you know, I brought the hand shmore. And my, and my, my siblings had, took some. And my mother was excited by it also. Kind of, it actually tastes better, probably, very likely. You know, I remember that. Like, I remember that. That's a memory. Fast forward 25 years. I'm walking with my son, Yaakov. And he says to me, Abba. You know, I've been thinking and I've been learning. And I, I would like to just get your permission. I would like to do machine shmura. I had to say it. I said, yeah. I said, Yaakov, we have an argument in this house. He said to me, yeah. The minah by us is the son to do different than the father. <laughs> That's the minah. There's something magical about the misora and the connection and the ability to be vulnerable and real on Seder night. Seder night is often a little bit difficult because you have different worlds that collide and clash under the same last family name. I often like, when I am being cynical, like to say Seder night is the night of unmet expectations. It's both the night of unmet expectations and the night of the magic of transmitting the passion of the Misora, 
we have to understand and appreciate. I asked my father, and this is a, this I'll conclude as I'm driving. He asked me when I'm speaking my Shabbos Agado. And I told him, Emuna, I want to talk a little bit about Emuna, living, loving, and teaching Emuna on Seder night. So my father said to me, he's not a man of many words. He said to me, it's the way you demonstrate it. It's the way you model it. Great values are not taught, they are caught. We have to walk into that Seder all ready to be passionate. We have to walk into that Seder with the recognition that on this beautiful night, there are all eyes are on us. And if we have that real, sincere sense that on this night, a Kaddish Baruch Hu says, I want you close and closer. I brought you close and I want you closer. And on, that, on this night, you have that capacity of feeling the intimacy with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then you will be able to not just grow yourself, but also be able to mashpia, properly impact in ways that probably are not so discernible all the time, but impact all those that are around you. May Hashem bless all of us that this should be the last Seder in Golas. We should be Zoha to really be Mekayim, the Shana HaBab Yushalayim, Shalayim HaBenuya, as the Gemara says, that in the Seder night, the carbon Pesach would be eaten a little kezayis, and then the rooftops would be flowing, would be exploding with the dancing and the singing of the Hallel. Imagine millions of Jews singing Hallel on the rooftops of Yushalayim. Kezayis, Pischa the Halila, Upaka Igra. Amazing imagery that the Gemara tells us. We should be zochet to feel that and experience that. Thank you very much.